Freeman Dyson is here. He has spent a lifetime grappling with some of the toughest problems in science and beyond. As a young physicist, he achieved worldwide recognition by merging three competing theories of quantum physics. Dyson has since become a best-selling author on topics from biotechnology to extraterrestrial intelligence. In recent years, he has emerged as a critic of climate change. In March, the New York Times profiled him in an article called The Global Warming Heretic. The piece asked, how did Freeman Dyson, revered scientist, liberal intellectual problem solver, wind up infuriating the environmentalist? We'll ask that and more. I'm pleased to have Freeman Dyson back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. I'll get to this in a moment, but you really stirred him up when you, when you talk about global warming, don't you? So that article, of course, is totally misleading. It is uh, uh, global warming is a very small part of my concern. I, 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 and he. The, the Nicholas Davidoff, who wrote it, is yeah. a very fine writer. He is indeed. But it's mostly fiction rather than fact. Now, how could a very fine writer write fiction rather than fact? Well, it, it, he had his agenda, which wasn't mine. What, what was his agenda? Well, he t his agenda was to write a piece about global warming. Right. He told me he was going to do a profile of me, yeah. and and it, it was uh, he twisted it into a story about global warming. Which is really, I don't claim to be an expert on that subject. I'm not an, an activist, and I certainly am not a, a, an appropriate person to to be a, a p political activist. Of, uh, and so it gave, I think, a very misleading view. However, I mean, it, the pictures are beautiful, and so I can't complain. <laughs> well, it's like your tie. You have a beautiful tie. <laughs> <laughs> Which my wife chose for me this morning. Well, so, so. this morning, she picks out your clothes when you leave in the morning? Not usually. But the but ties. <laughs> <laughs> or for television. For television, yes. <laughs> well, she has good taste. Thank you. <laughs> so what is your view on global warming? Well, I'm very skeptical. However small or large it is into the context of all the things you care about. Yes, I, I, I'm very skeptical about all the pronouncements that are made by the experts. I know how completely uncertain the subject is, so I would say just don't believe the experts. But I don't claim to be an expert myself, so I won't argue with anybody about details. And I'm certainly not a sort of spokesman for the opponents of, 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 the, of the prevailing dogmas. I haven't given much time to it, and I don't pretend to, to, to know what the, re, the the real answers are. All I'm, what I'm, what I know for sure is that most of the people who make pronouncements don't know either. All right. Well, maybe you don't know. So let me just ask some questions. And you just say I don't know. Do you deny the world is getting warmer? No. You don't deny that. Absolutely. Clearly, not. the world no. is getting warmer. No, I went to Greenland myself, and because where the warming is most extreme. And it's quite spectacular, of course, what you see in Greenland. But what is also true is that people there love it. The people there hope it continues. It makes their lives a lot more pleasant. Okay, but do you believe that if, in fact, there continues to be global warming uh, in, in those regions that we will eliminate the ice and therefore there will be a rising of the water level and therefore at some point it will threaten us all? No. I don't, I don't believe that. I mean, the, the point is that, that the sea level has been rising for 12,000 years, and it has nothing to do with global warming. It, it is nothing? It's a separate problem. I mean, it, but does, does global warming contribute to it? Probably, but we don't know how much. And it's certainly not a, 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 the, the, the main problem when, when you're dealing with a rising ocean. I mean, we know it's been going on for 12,000 years. We know it, it, it has very little to do with human activities. So it would be a great, it would be a terrible mistake to think you solved the problem of the rising ocean when you're only dealing with climate. What else need you do? Well, we don't know. It, 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 we don't know the causes. And it's absurd to imagine that you can treat a disease without doing a diagnosis. If you're a scientist, you don't jump to conclusions. Right. So, but, but here's what some people say. They say, if climate warms at, uh, say, the current rate for next hundred years, the difference in climate will be as dramatic as the difference at the end of the Ice Age. I think that that's extremely unlikely, but of course I don't know. It, I mean, it, it certainly, there's no evidence that that's true. Why are they so excited about you saying all these things if you simply are saying, I don't know? 
What is it you're saying that really gets under their skin? I don't know whether it gets under their skin. I mean, that again was exaggerated in the New York Times. It right. has, the New York I mean, Times. I've never, I've never <laughs> got under anybody's skin, as far as I know. Yeah. And I have, I mean, uh, Jim Hansen, for example, right. is portrayed a revered in that, uh, or a respected, maybe yes, is a better he's, word. Yes, he's my friend. And, yes, and we're portrayed in that article as enemies. That he was a uh, manipulator, just as I was. Do you and Jim Hansen have the same view about climate change? No, but we are friendly. Yeah. We have divergent views, but we're, we're quite good friends. And so, I mean, both of us, I think, felt aggrieved because we were, we were yeah, pulled perceived out of, as if somehow you are antagonist. Yes. Other than different opinions about a central issue. Yes, we happen to agree about a lot of things. I want to ask you about these facts because uh, you know everybody looks at them. The average temperatures climb to 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, around the world since 1880, much of this in recent decades. Is that true? Yes. Okay. The rate of warming is increasing. The 20th century's last two decades were, were the hottest in 400 years. The last two decades were the hottest in 400 years. That's probably true, but it's but the last actually well the last decade has been cooler. And and uh, I mean, cooler than the previous decade. Or? Yes. Okay. And 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 it, 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 it's not at all clear whether the the rise is continuing or not. You also believe that certain biotechnologies will, in the end, serve to reduce the impact of global warming. Yes, I think. In, uh, because uh, first of all, I don't believe global warming is bad. I mean, I think that's the first question to be settled. Okay, so is global warming bad? No, I would say the warming is certainly real, but it's mostly happening in cold places. At, High latitudes, yeah. it, 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 and it's also happening more in winter than in summer, and it's also happening more at night than in daytime. But is the emission of so is the emission of so much CO2 into the atmosphere a good thing? Yes. Even though it breaks the whatever it does up there. Yes, I would say it is a very good thing. It makes plants grow better. Yeah, but they, but it's plants good. cannot consume all the CO2 that's out there. No, but still, they certainly are growing better because of the CO2. We, we do know that. And it's true of crop plants. It's also true of forests. So all so the CO2 doesn't bother you, even though... No, it that, it, that's a big plus. And then against that, you have possible harmful effects of warming. But I think it's most important that the warming is happening in places which are cold. It's happening in places in, in winter rather than in summer yeah. and at night rather than in daytime. So it means that it's essentially evening out the climate rather than just making everything hotter. I mean, it, what's interesting is that you are not arguing with the facts, you are arguing with the conclusions. Yes. Right? Absolutely. I mean, for example, glaciers and mountain snows are melting in Montana's Glacier National Park. Is well, that a good thing? Well, it's partly good and partly bad, but what we know for sure is that the glaciers have been melting long before humans had any act. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, there's a point you differ too. You don't think that human contribution to global warming is as significant as the critics, those who very vehemently oppose global warming and want to do something about it, argue? Well, well that I would say we don't know. What we do know is that glaciers were shrinking in Switzerland and many other places long before human activities became, became significant. So whatever causes glaciers to shrink, it, it's not only humans. Right. Let me talk about, so in the context of Freeman Dyson's remarkable life, here you are in your 80s. Right. What concerns you today? What do you worry about? What I worry are about nuclear weapons. Okay, so that's you've written last, about nuclear weapons. That's the number one problem to me. And unfortunately, this, all, all this fuss about global warming distracts people from more important things. Well, they can hold two thoughts in their head at the same time. Some people can. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, last night, we had a, yes. last night we had in Princeton a commemoration of Hiroshima. Right. Some uh, two actual survivors of the bombings, one from Hiroshima and one from Nagasaki, Nagasaki right. spoke about their experiences. That's what we should be thinking about. Time has come to get rid of nuclear weapons, and, and that's my primary concern in, in recent years. Lots of people have that concern. Yes, and I'm happy that it's becoming 
now a more visible issue. In, including the President of the United States. Right. And including Henry Kissinger and George Shultz and Sam Nunn and lots of other people. Right. Particularly the gang around Reagan. Yeah, exactly. Reagan, in fact, himself was. He was an abolitionist. He prepared to negotiate it away. Yes. And that's, uh, I think, the beauty of it, that it is something that the right-wing Republicans generally believe in. And so it's something that we may have a chance to do. Mutually assured destruction is not a very good idea. I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, it, it, it works up to a point. It's not something we should rely on in, 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 in forever. And you think the United States, to lead the way, should reduce its stockpile of weapons by how much? I would say total. I mean, I'd like just to, go right I'd out like and to go to, get uh, rid of all of them and show my, the world the right direction. That's what Nixon did with biological weapons, and, and it was a wonderful move. He did it unilaterally, so he didn't have to have it ratified by the Senate. He didn't have to negotiate with anybody. He just said, "We get rid of our weapons. We'd destroy the stockpiles," and and it happened just in one afternoon. That's, I think that's the right Would way. we be less secure as a nation? I don't think so. But, of course, that's a matter of opinion. The, <laughs> the, the public generally believes yes. that nuclear weapons give them some kind of security. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think so. It's a, it's, a, it's a question of balance, of course. But I think... So that, suppose we gave up all our nuclear weapons. Do you think the Russians would then give up all theirs? No, not necessarily. But the, I think the world would be safer not having ours. The real danger is that somebody steals a few of them. Ah, there's the danger, isn't it? And there's having, the um, danger. And, and so getting rid of ours would certainly help. Yeah, they're unlikely to steal ours. You're more likely to steal those in other places like Pakistan or Russia. Well, I don't think it's so clear. I once walked into a room in this country yeah. where there were 41 hydrogen bombs just lying around on the floor. Well, I've been on a submarine where they had 18. Yes. No, they're all over the place. And I don't think they're particularly safe. It's so, you know, you think if people using today's technology and today's um, strategies might very well steal a nuclear weapon from the United States uh, repository? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's of course, it, you depend on the fact that people are, are, are careless. Right. And... Uh, we are as just uh, as, as careless as other people. But it's more likely we do Pakistan or somewhere like that. It is not where there's more instability. Well, we, they have a lot fewer weapons. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, I don't say it's necessarily uh, uh, that we're any worse than the other people in taking care of them. I just say we're not perfect. Yeah. We're human beings. Okay, so you consider that the greatest problem of man and humankind. At the moment, yes. You know, doing away with nuclear weapons. Yes, well, I would say that and, and uh, uh, getting rid of poverty sort of on the same level. Yeah. And how, how are we doing on that? Well, very goal? well. I mean, I think the best thing that's happened in my lifetime, in, in, in a sense, is that China and India are becoming rich. Because that's the sort of the center of gravity of the world is there in China and India. If those become rich countries, it means that the majority of the human, humankind is rich rather than poor. That, to me, is a huge achievement. In the remainder of your life, whether it's 10 years or 20 years or whatever it might be, what do you most want to achieve? Well, I don't have illusions that I my, by myself will achieve any of these big things. I just I like to... to to push gently and, and, and help to push things in a sensible way. As you know, most people think that your most interesting ideas in physics came a long time ago. That's true. I know it is. <laughs> but I enjoy life, and I, I don't particularly care whether what I'm doing at that moment is important. <laughs> it's whether it interests you. Is that the test? Yes. I mean, is it challenging and interesting to you? Yes. I mean, science, of course, to me is just uh, fun and and. It's just like like painting pictures or anything else. That, it's a puzzle. Yes, it's it's well. I would say it's a technical skill which is fun to to exercise. Yeah, there is this idea that physics has had its century. That was the twentieth century, and the twenty first century belongs to molecular biology and brain science. And I rather I I think that's quite likely to be true. I mean that it, it's, it's certain that physics has slowed down during my lifetime, 
largely just because the experiments have become so slow. But biology at the same time has been speeding up. So I think it's probably true that this century yeah. is the century because, of bio biology. Because of the discovery of the structure of DNA and then the, and the mapping of the human genome and everything yes, else. All these, uh, I think all these sciences are driven more by tools than by ideas. Tools being the computer? The computer being the big one for the t 20th century. But, right. but uh, the, t the, the tools for, for, for the biologists, of course, are, uh, are gene sequences right. Right. And, and gene synthesizers. Yeah. Now we can read and write genomes. At, at and, and we're understanding more about disease than we had in the whole not, history that, that's, of humankind. That, but that's, that's going slow. I mean, the, 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 the healing part of biology is really tough. But well, it's, it's not easy to understand how all these cells work. No, and certainly we're not doing well with the war against cancer and such No, things. why do you think that is? Well, the, the nature is just a lot more complicated than, than we hoped. Well, that's but, true. But, to, to, but I, I, I have uh, 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 tremendous respect for nature. That nature is almost always smarter than we are, and that's what makes biology so exciting. Why is nature smarter than we are? It's had a much longer time to to, to work out the details. <laughs> and it takes care of itself. Yes. Left alone, nature will take care of itself. It does, of course, in a in a marvelous way. And I've talked to, and this is not to name drop, but I've done one interview with him, Stephen Hawking. Good. Uh, and, and others that have worked with him and studied yes. under him and all that stuff. No, that's one person I have enormous respect for. Because? Just because Because of I, his personal life story or because of his discovery? Both. I mean, he's just, he's great in both respects, as a human being and as a, as a scientist. And, and uh, no, I, 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 I I, I think he's one of the few people I would say clearly deserves a Nobel Prize and hasn't got one. I don't know why. But, I mean, is he considered one of the top ten physicists in the world today? By me, yes. By you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that's all that matters, isn't it? <laughs> Not all that matters, but for, anyway. But, no, he's terrific, and, and I just heard that he's got very yeah, he was sick, sick no, and, right. and recovered. He and, and, and recovered. He's just he's amazingly tough. You know him, though. The last time I met him, he was in a bar in Tokyo. In a bar? In Tokyo, drinking whiskey, <laughs> <laughs> having a good well, what time. What were you doing there? I was there just, just uh, drinking whiskey, too. But <laughs> <laughs> now, what I think he was having more fun than I was. <laughs> what, about, what happened to the Super Collider? The Super Collider... I, 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 Explain I, to her what it was, just so we know that. Yes, it's a big machine in, 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 in Geneva mm -hmm. on the border between Switzerland and France. Over there but, rather than here because they paid for it. Yes, the Europeans built it and paid for it. And I think it's a great machine. It'll do a lot of interesting science. Like what? It will uh, discover uh, things that weren't expected. Right. Uh, that's... That's what the science is all about. If you knew in advance what you're going to discover, it's not, it's not interesting. Yeah. And so we hope it will discover lots of things that nobody imagined. But it has technical problems. There are, big machines very often do. It's nothing unusual in that, that they switched it on and, and something broke. Yes, that's true. <laughs> to their great disappointment. And it is disappointing, but still, I mean, sooner or later they'll get it working. Well, when? That well, we don't know, but uh, we have to think on a long time scale. I mean, that's the, that's why physics is slowing down because these machines are slow. Mm. You have a, a machine of that size because they're doing such huge mathematical computations and everything else. Yes, so they took ten years to design it, ten years to build it, and ten years to get it right to get it actually to work. <laughs> is it? Um, that's that's a, a, most of a lifetime, which is a shame. What is the great question that you would like to see answered? Well, to my mind, the most exciting questions are really in biology. I mean, that that uh, the question I've been, I even got so concerned I actually wrote a book about it is the origin of life. Right. It is a good problem because everybody is equally ignorant. So even I could write a book about it, and, and it's um, so it's a complete mystery. And so how, what did you determine about the origins of life? Well, I I'm simply speculating that it actually had two origins. Adam and that, Eve. That we had our, our 
living creatures are, are made of two components, right. which right. are sort of hardware and software, like like computers, and the hardware being right. living creatures are made of two components: hardware and software. Yes, the hardware being sort of the chemistry of things, what they call metabolism, right. the eating and drinking and, and mm. uh, processing chemicals, where all, where all the real uh, processing of all the, all, the, all the active things like nerves and muscles and so on are made of hardware, proteins. Mm. And then there's the software, which is the, the, the genes, the genomes, and, right, and, right. which is uh, uh, just the instructions for how to build it. And, and so we have these two components, which are very separate in, in, in life as we know it. So I'm making the, the hypothesis that really it was unlikely that they both were there from the beginning. It's much more likely that they originated separately. That so that Simultaneously or? No, on the contrary, had that you had the hardware first. Right. And then so you had life evolving without genes for a long time. And then the genes were then an independent creature, which originally were parasites, and then took over the, 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 the took over the direction, so that they became then a, 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 it became then a symbiosis, a collaborative system, which both of them worked together. And that seemed to me a reasonable point of view, but I don't claim it's true. Mm. What do you think about the possibilities of nanotechnology? Well, there again, it's been hyped a bit too much, but I mean, clearly it's very real. That nanotechnology is really a way of producing new materials, and so we've got a lot of interesting materials which are coming along. It's not a, a deep science in, in the same way as, as genetics. Stephen Hawking talks about the search for the theory of everything. Are you interested in a theory of everything? Well, I hope it doesn't exist. I mean, I think it would be very disappointing. It would show that God had been lacking in imagination if everything could be explained. Now, wait a minute. God had been lacking in imagination. If everything was explained by a single theory. How do you, how do you um, get your mind around religion and science? Well, I think they both are real and they both say something about the universe. But, they, but they're quite different. I, I think of them as two windows through which you can look, but you can't look at both th at the same time. And so f for, for scientists who say to those people of faith, I, I, I appreciate your faith, but I can't believe anything that I can't see and that I can't prove. Well, it, that's, of course, a correct statement if you're th meaning by belief, scientific belief. But, mm -hmm. of course... I mean, I, I think a religious a religion is not just about belief. It's about? It's about a, a way of life. It's a community. It's a big literature. It's a music and architecture. It's a whole... It's a big part of human life, which is really not so much dependent on belief. Are you, you a religious be, man by that definition? Yes. But I certainly don't believe any, any particular theology. And what do you think of Richard Dawkins? Well, I like Richard Dawkins as a human being, but I think he's done a lot of harm by telling young people that you have to be an atheist in order to be a scientist. That's a stupid thing to say because it, it, it sort of put, it, it, it actually pushes away a lot of young people from science who don't want to give up religion. Um, are you optimistic about all of us Yes. in the end? Oh, very optimistic. It's quite amazing how much we've been able to do in the short time we came, uh, came down from the trees. And I mean, we have uh, talents which to me are, are quite extraordinary because they don't have any obvious survival value, like, for example, calculating numbers. I mean, who needs to calculate numbers in order to survive? It's, it's not at all clear. Why should we be able to compose string quartets? Why should we, we be able to paint paintings? Everything we do, we do is so much more than you require just to survive. So you're optimistic about our future because you look at where we've come from and, and uh, we've evolved not badly. I would say we're doing Even though we've built these bombs that could destroy us. 
And we've done amazingly well not using them for 70 years or whatever. Have we been kind to the planet? Yes, I would say on Do the whole, really? yes. Do you really? A lot of people don't have that view, as you know. You, that, yes. You're in a distinct minority on that. Yes. Including our good friend E.O. Wilson yes. at Harvard. Oh, yes. So you look a bit about alike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the fact is, of course, uh, we've done a lot of damage to the planet, but we also uh, repair the damage. It's, it, it, and, I, mean, I grew up in England, and England was far more filthy then than it is now. Because we had the Industrial Revolution right. first. And so Eng England was much more polluted than the United States ever has been. And uh, England now is quite comparatively clean. And you can go to London and your collar doesn't get black in one day. <laughs> and the food's gotten better. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, and look at Pittsburgh. I mean, yeah. the same thing's happened in Los Angeles. Uh, smog in Los Angeles is nothing much any, anymore. And yeah. Have you been to Beijing? Yes. And, uh, and you're not bothered by that, and you want them to build every coal-burning plant that they want to build. Yes, they should clean up the coal, but of course, that you can do. The, 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 the uh, global warming people don't make a distinction between carbon dioxide, which is uh, essentially, uh, in my view, harmless, yeah. and the other things in coal, which are horrible, soot and, sm and smog and nitrogen oxides and all that stuff. I mean, there's a lot of very ugly stuff in coal, which you can get rid of by scrubbing the coal and uh, scrubbing the, the gases that come out of the f yeah. power station. And uh, so the, the, the Chinese certainly can do a lot more of that, and they are doing a lot more of that. You are a member of Jason. Yes. What is that? Jason is a group of consultants who work for the government. We've been ju just in existence for 50 years. 50? Yes. So we're just celebrating our 50th birthday. What does Jason do? Well, we work for the government. I mean, the, at the moment, we're doing a study about nuclear weapons, which is one of the things we've always been interested in. That We were asked by Congress to do this, in fact, to, to uh, assess the state of the stockpile and, and how, how, how you can establish a, a stockpile that is reliable without doing tests. Mm -hmm. And that's so. So that's one part one part of Jason's activities. Suppose they come to you and Jason said, "Here's the project. I want you to help us design a weapon that will give us a deterrent." What would you say? Well, I'd look at the details. I mean, because I, I, Jason is not in the business of inventing weapons anyway. But but well, it's in the business of what? It's advising the government about uh, all kinds of technical Important pro problems. Technical problems, but mostly minor problems. Right. I mean, what we are best at is just killing stupid ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems to me like a worthy function. <laughs> yes, that's what I think is m most useful about what we're doing. So <laughs> somebody <laughs> tells us they, they have a wonderful scheme for detecting submarines, and you only, they only need $100 million to get started. and, and <laughs> and then we demonstrate that the thing is no good. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Freeman Dyson, um, an interesting man, and you've had a remarkable life, and you continue to live with great spirit and great fun, and, and I admire you for, for the spirit and passion you bring to conversation. Thank you.